Well, growing up, I had a dad who liked sports. But honestly, it wasn't really much of my thing. I played sports, uh, wrestling, uh, soccer, baseball. Honestly, I wasn't a great athlete, so I wasn't super into it. I was more of a musician. I didn't watch a whole lot of sports. Like all Minnesotans, my heart was broken in 98 with the wide left field goal, Gary Anderson, who hadn't missed a single field goal all season, so we did not go to the Super Bowl that year. And so I watched, stopped watching football for a long time. We moved to Colorado, uh, working at a church out there. I wasn't super into the Broncos, anything like that, th until 2011, they drafted this kid named Tim Tebow. How many of you guys have heard of Tim Tebow? Yeah, so then it was Tebow time in Denver, and I was like, man, I'm in. This guy, every time he scores a touchdown, he did the Tebow, right? It was fun, and I was like, I'm a Broncos fan. Well, we then moved to Wisconsin to help plant a church in 2011, and when we were there, I was told, okay, Eric, you have to become a Packers fan to fit in. Now, again, I'd grown up cheering for the Vikings. Uh, I was cheering for the Broncos. And so I was like, okay, sure, we'll become Packers fans. So Kristen and I were newly in Wisconsin, and we buy Packers sweatshirts because we're like, we got to fit in. And we post a picture of, like, our first fall of sitting with some other people in Wisconsin with our Packers gear cheering on the Packers. And boy, let me tell you, our family in Wisconsin, or I mean in Minnesota and Colorado, thought that we had joined a cult, which maybe we had. And man, they like ostracized us and still give us a hard time about that. Now, that one season, the Packers did go 15 and 1 that I cheered for them. Uh, that's beside the point. But boy, you know, you do some weird things when you're trying to fit in with others. Uh, and so now I'm a happy Seahawks fan, or I was until Russell Wilson left. But the thing is, we all have this, like, do we want to be in or out, right? And so we cheer for these teams. We wear this sports apparel because it's like, man, I'm part of the in club. Like us rec league dads who do rec league baseball, we always kind of chuckle at the kids who play Storm, which is the Maple Grove's baseball team. Because, you know, how do you know that you've met, like, a dad whose kid plays in Storm? Don't worry, he'll tell you, because uh, he's going to be wearing some storm gear, right? Because it's like, I, I'm in the in club. How does this look like in politics? More and more, we're seeing ever-increasing polarization of things going further and further left, further and further right. We talk about this in our men's Bible study, right? As we draw smaller and smaller circles on who's in and who's out. This has been going on a long, long time. I mean, I remember, uh, you know, whatever it was, 10, 15 years ago, like Senator John McCain was like crucified by the right and the left because he wasn't conservative enough and he wasn't liberal enough. And the middle has disappeared in our politics. And this is why we are in this state because people are like, no, who's in, who's out? We start drawing more and more lines on who's in and who's out. I forget the numbers, but there are thousands of denominations because again, the lines kept getting drawn. Well, do we receive communion? You know, by dipping or not, we'll start a new denomination on this. You know, uh, on the creed, let's change one word, interpretation, let's start a new denomination, right? We see this again and again and again, that groups draw smaller and smaller circles and say, are you going to be in or are you out? So what's the answer here? What's the answer when we look at politics and things moving increasingly left and right and there is no middle? of people saying, like, man, you can't be a Packers fan and live, you know, in Minnesota, uh, that, you know, uh, uh, just what is your interest? And I only hang out with people who have the same interests as me. Man, this is a problem not just for adults, it's middle schoolers, high schoolers, right? Like, what group are you in? Are you in or are you out? The good thing is Jesus had a lot to say with both his words and his actions about who's in and who's out. And that's what we're going to be exploring tonight, about who's in and who's out, and how does that affect us. Let's look at Luke chapter 5, verse 27. You can turn there if you've got your Bibles. It says, after this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi, another, or Matthew, sitting at the tax booth. So we've been in chapter 5 for a couple of weeks now, and we saw at the beginning of chapter 5, Phil from Clarity Church uh, did a great job talking about that. How Jesus is walking along uh, the Sea of Galilee, and he invites some good Jewish boys. Hey, come follow me. 
And so Peter and his brother Andrew and James and his brother John, they left their nets and they followed Jesus. Then we saw the story after that of, of a man with leprosy. And Jesus reaches out and touches the man who's untouchable. Doesn't just heal him with a word, but he actually reaches out and enters this man's mess. A man who hadn't felt a touch in years and years, perhaps decades. That's what Jesus does. He touches the untouchables. Then we saw the story, one of my favorites, where they'd heard good news had gotten out about Jesus the healer. And so Jesus shows up at someone's community group. And that's a good day when Jesus shows up at your community group. And he's teaching. And these four friends want to get their buddy who's paralyzed to Jesus. They can't get into the door. Religious people are blocking that. So they cut a hole in the roof. And they lure him down. What does Jesus do? He doesn't heal him. He forgives his sins. And everyone's disappointed. And then Jesus says, all right, to show that I can forgive sins, pick up your mat and walk. And Jesus heals him. So this is right after that. So he's got Peter, James, John, Andrew. They're following him. They're doing some good things. Uh, and, and now he's been walking, and they see this guy, Levi, or Matthew, at his tax booth. Now, the only category I can really describe a tax collector, because we hear that and we're like, just think kind of IRS, right? But really, it's someone, if you, like, if you saw a 22-year-old selling drugs to kids behind Osseo Middle School, that's how Jewish people would see a tax collector. To them, it's like IRS plus ISIS. Like, this is the lowest of the low. Like, they do not like them. Uh, you don't initiate a conversation with them. You don't approach him uh, because he's just going to rip you off. Like, this is just repulsive. Tax collectors were excluded from all religious fellowship, weren't even allowed to go into the temple. Uh, according to some sources I read, rabbis believed tax collectors had no hope of salvation. There is no hope for a tax collector. The, the, this is who these people are. See, what happened is Rome the dominant empire in this day had conquered pretty much all the known world. And then what they did is they auctioned off the rights to collect tribute taxes for them. And then the deal was, hey, you can collect as much as you want as long as we get this amount of money. Anything over and above, you can keep the rest of that. So you kind of figure out how much can I rip people off, right? And you have the Roman legions behind you. So oftentimes these tax collectors would be ripping off their own countrymen. And it got worse because paying your taxes was a reminder that it felt like God had abandoned us. God, why are we slaves in our own nation? This money is going to fund the evil empire and their soldiers who are keeping us in bondage. And so tax collectors were hated by their countrymen because they're ripping them off. They're getting rich. And this money is going to be funded to the empire. And, and, and because they had this, we're going to take advantage of you, Jewish people did not initiate any kind of relationship with tax collectors. So what Jesus d does is very unexpected. That Jesus approaches the unapproachable tax collector. Jesus initiates relationship with him. This is what theologians call the doctrine of election. This is the fancy word, the, the election, that we don't look for God, but God looks for us. We don't seek God, but God is seeking after sinners and inviting them into relationship with us. This is what's different about Christianity than other religions. See, Buddhism and so many others say, hey, you need to do these things to try to get to God. Jesus says, no, 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 no. I've done the hard work. Simply come. That's what makes Christianity different. It's just a simple an invitation. It says, hey, God is looking for sinners. He's approaching us. And see, Levi, he's a sinner. He's not looking for Jesus. He's not approaching Jesus. He's just in his tax booth doing what he's always done. He's not pursuing him, but Jesus is pursuing him. And then Jesus calls on him to change his life to repent of his ways, to demonstrate that by walking away from his career, his power, his income, and to be a follower of Jesus. This is an act of repentance. He's repenting of his old way of life, and he's trusting Jesus for a new way of life. We talk about this. Repentance means you're going one direction, and you decide to turn, and you're going a different way. Belief in Jesus is not just some mental assent to a list of beliefs. It's following Jesus. It's saying, I was going this way, and now I'm turning, and I'm going to follow Jesus. 
So the beautiful thing is Jesus doesn't just forgive sinners, he befriends sinners. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. But Jesus doesn't just forgive sinners, he befriends them. He says, hey, I don't want to just give you some forgiveness and wipe away your debts. He does that. But he says, now come be in relationship with me. Come walk with me. Follow closely behind me. There was a saying in this time that, uh, that apprentices or disciples of rabbis would be called by rabbis to follow them. And you'd call out and say, hey, hey, you come follow me. And there was a saying, sometimes people say, hey, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. That you're following so close behind your rabbi that his dust as he's walking is covering you. That's Jesus' invitation to us. Not just to believe something, but to follow him. And so Jesus is inviting this man to do what he invites us to do as followers of Jesus. To say, he's the leader, we're the follower. It's all about Jesus. Amen? Now, there's a lot of things that Jesus could have said to Levi, right? He could have said, hey, I bet your mother's really proud of you, working for the evil empire. Like, how can you work for the Romans? Of all the things that Jesus could have said, he simply says, follow me. And I can imagine Peter and Andrew and James and John, these four good Jewish boys who are fishermen, as an audible gasp as they said, what, Jesus? You're inviting this guy to come follow? And it's like, I'm, think, I'm sure they're thinking, wait, wait, wait. Because if, if he follows you, that means he's going to join our group and he's going to be around us. And we're cool because we're fishermen and we're kind of competition, but this guy, this guy's going to be with us? Verse 28. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. Like, just like those four Jewish boys left their nets and followed Jesus. Like, why? Well, again, you have to, if you die, dive into the history of this, right, right, like the most honorable thing that could happen was a rabbi saying to you, come follow me. And so boys would go to school, a couple years, the best would go to the next level, the best of the best would go to the next level, and only the best of the best of the best would be invited by rabbis to come follow them. So those who don't make that cut... They follow the trades of their fathers, right? They've got fishermen, carpenters, tax collectors. So these boys, every other rabbi has passed them by. But now Jesus says, hey, come follow me. And that is why they, like, what someone believes in me? This invitation to follow means a rabbi believes that you can be like me. Because a rabbi only calls someone to follow them if they believe you have what it takes to be like me, that you, I can reproduce myself in you. I'm not going to waste my time with people who can't do that. That's why it makes way more sense when Peter sees Jesus walking on the water. He's like, okay, you invited me to follow you. Then you're saying I can do what you can do. I guess I can walk on water. And then Peter has doubts, right? And he sinks. Jesus says, why didn't you believe but I believe in you, that you could be like me. So this is why Levi is like, what, this rabbi wants me to follow him, I'm going to leave it all behind. Now, you might be thinking, wait, it can't be this simple. That this tax collector who's ripping off his countrymen to, to fund the empire, he can just follow Jesus. To, aren't there hoops he has to go through? But Jesus simply invites this despised out, outsider to follow him and become part of his inner circle. Jesus doesn't say, hey, if you're willing to do blank, you can follow me. Hey, if you're willing to stop doing blank, you can follow me. Right? We watched that little video clip on, on Good Friday where the man, the thief on the cross goes to heaven. And they're like, how'd you get in? Like, do you understand the justification of my faith? Do you understand the inspiration of scripture? No. How? The man in the middle said I could come. Right? Jesus says, hey, come follow me. Levi, you've done these things. You're not, you're ashamed of your actions. Everyone else thinks you're a pariah. They want nothing to do with you. But I want something to do with you. Come, follow me. I believe in you. Jesus says, follow me. This is what Jesus does throughout all the Gospels. He just asks people to follow him. He doesn't say, believe in me. He says, hey, come, follow me. So now the scene shifts. And all of a sudden, now we're at a party at Levi's house. 
If you think Peter and Andrew and James and John had an issue with a tax collector coming beside them and walking with them, now they're in his house. Like, they have to be so uncomfortable. I'm sure Peter's like, wait a minute, Jesus. We're going to whose house? No way. Like, uh, I can't be seen there. And it just gets worse, right? Verse 29. And Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclined at table with him. A large company. It's like, it's getting worse. Now there are more of them, right? It's like there's a whole bunch of tax collectors, because that's the only friends Levi has is other tax collectors. And I'm sure Peter's like, man, I don't like this, as they're squeezing in, right, and rubbing shoulders with these people that normally they would never talk to. Let me tell you why this is such a big deal. It's because Jesus was extraordinarily comfortable with people who weren't anything like him. And people who were nothing like Jesus were comfortable being around him. Wow, it's one of the reasons. There's so many, right? They love Jesus. Because he's so comfortable in his own skin that he's like, hey, I know who I am. I can be around people who are different than me, who have nothing in common with me. You guys ever been around someone who's just super comfortable in their own skin? And it's just like easy to be with them. They're just, they know who they are. They're not trying to like one up you. Uh, I was visiting another church this morning and this other pastor like knew I wrestled in the past and he like put me in like a, ch- uh, a wrestling hold. And I was like, what are you doing, man? We're like in this church lobby, right? And uh, yeah, I didn't let him get the best of me. But it's like, right, there's some people that are always trying to prove something. That's not Jesus. Jesus is completely comfortable with who he is. And because of that, people were extraordinarily comfortable being around him who were nothing like him. And that's the thing is, if people come into our church and aren't comfortable, that's on us, not on Jesus. Because people liked being around Jesus. Jesus would like you. He would not be put off by your sin. He would not be uncomfortable knowing your thoughts because he knows them. Jesus knows everything possible to know about Levi, and he simply says, follow me. And what does Levi immediately do? He throws a party and invites all his friends to come meet Jesus. And he becomes very generous. Immediately you can see the Holy Spirit work in his heart. He goes from a very greedy man to a very generous man. As soon as he meets Jesus, he wants other people to meet Jesus. So he throws a huge party. And throwing parties is a ministry, okay? Some churches are bad at that. We're pretty good at it. We're going to keep getting better at it because throwing parties is a good thing, amen? Feed them well. Make it fun. Make it nice. We've seen that wherever Jesus goes, he's shadowed by these religious leaders, these Pharisees. So these religious leaders are following Jesus, and all of a sudden they get to Levi's house, and Levi's like, hold up, you're not invited. Verse 30, and the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled, because they weren't invited, at his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? I love that for them, tax collectors are so bad, they get their own category, right? It's like sinners and then tax collectors, even worse than normal sinners. And these religious leaders are like, why is Jesus eating with these people? He's a rabbi. He's a holy man. We're a holy man. He worships God. We worship God. We have a lot in common. Why didn't Jesus invite us? Why is it that he'd rather choose to spend time with people who are nothing like him? Jesus is sitting around a table with Levi's and his friends, and there's some commotion outside, right? This is like the part in a movie where the music stops, it screeches to a halt. Jesus hears the Pharisees outside. I think he kind of shouts at them maybe. Verse 31, and Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Now again, picture your Levi. And Jesus is hanging out with you. He's like, hey, you know who needs me is the sick people. Right? And Levi's like, whoa, Jesus, hang on a minute. <laughs> That's a little offensive. And again, I think Jesus is full of joy. I think he would laugh and be like, Levi, yeah, you are sick, man, right? You need help. You need what I've got. And I think maybe Levi looks at his other buddies like, you're right, we are sick. Yeah, dude, they high five, right? We're pretty sick, right? I'm like, yeah, we need the cure. We need Jesus. Jesus is so winsome, he could say out loud, I'm here with the sick people. Like, high five, Matthew. See, people like Levi who are willing to look in the mirror and say, I need something. I am sick. I need some help. These are the kind of people 
who are prime candidates to be followers of Jesus. Verse 32, he says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He says he's come to call. Jesus says, hey, I'm not content to hang out with people like you Pharisees who believe the right things and behave the right way and only want to hang out with people who believe and behave the right way. He says, hey, I want to join with people who believe the right things and behave the right way so we can call people who wish they had more control over the way they behave. People who know they need some help. What I'm going to say next, this is for us Jesus followers. We dare not become a church that is content to just gather with those who believe the right way and behave the right way. Because if we do, we might find ourselves standing outside, looking in on what God is doing. I don't want to pastor. I don't want to attend. I don't want kids to attend a church. That is only for those who believe the right way and behave the right way. We are called to be a church who calls those who are sick to come meet Jesus. Amen? To partner with our Savior to call those who feel like there has to be more. Who are uncertain. Who need healing. We get to partner with our Savior and call those who feel outsiders. Who all their life felt like, man, I don't belong. I'm not welcome at that church. Say, no, no, no. Jesus invites you in to come follow him. We get to introduce people who don't feel like they fit in anywhere else to Jesus and invite them to the party, to invite their questions and their concerns and their mess. And to say, hey, you may not have it all figured out. That's okay. Come, explore in community. Ask your questions. It's not enough to just believe the right things or behave the right way. Or else we're in danger of becoming Pharisees, and we miss why Jesus came. See, the Pharisees say, change, and then you can join us. Jesus says, join us, and you will change. Big difference. Jesus says, hey, I want to invite you to take a baby step and come follow me. But I'm going to warn you that one of these days as you continue to follow me, you're going to look in the mirror. You're not going to recognize yourself because you're going to start looking like me. But Jesus says, hey, I just want you to follow me. So let's get practical. What does this look like for us who are followers of Jesus? You might see in your, your note sheet, uh, we have some cool parties. I'm going to say, it's a Matthew party. So what is that? Is it we're celebrating Matt? Maybe. Matt's going to show up and we're all going, hey, good job. No, again, Levi, Matthew, another word. We're going to throw some Matthew parties. I want to encourage you to throw some Matthew parties. What does that look like? Uh, all sorts of different ways we can do Matthew parties. So Thursday of this week, I had the privilege of speaking for a breakfast in Bibles Club of uh, Maple Grove High School, just down the road here at Emmanuel Christian Center, the Maple Grove campus. If you don't know, uh, there's breakfast and Bible clubs are popping up all around the Twin Cities. It's really awesome. Uh, St. Michael's really were kind of birthed, and it's an incredible story. Uh, they now have their own building uh, uh, for their breakfast and Bible club, like across the street. Someone donated land. People donated concrete, a building. It's, it's, it's incredible. Um, and so there's one here every other week on Thursday mornings. They get different pastors come in, speak. And at 6.15 in the morning, which is pretty early, like 70 or so high school kids from Maple High School get together, and they get fed breakfast by a bunch of moms, uh, cheesy hash browns, uh, sausage, and uh, monkey bread, which is pretty good breakfast, right? And they just hear about Jesus. They play a game, and they get some, like, I, I got to speak to them about 20, 20, 25 minutes. And then a bunch of the upperclassmen drive the younger underclassmen to, to school. But what is that? That's a Matthew party. Some good food. People get to hear about Jesus. Oh, it's so cool is there's a table for like eight freshman boys. And they all had the same exact haircut. <laughs> they all were wearing like sweatshirts and joggers of like Maple Grove wrestling team. And you could tell, right? It's like one kid had invited his team there. It's like, come and hear about Jesus. If you don't know, uh, Phil who spoke here a couple weeks ago, he started, he started one at Osseo High School. 
uh, two years ago, I think. And so they meet uh, at the school on Wednesdays, Wednesday mornings, uh, 6.45 a.m. And, and again, so we as a church, we donated $500 to them to pay for breakfast. Because um, some ones, like the Anoka High School one, has like uh, a, a business who donates uh, their breakfast. But it's like, here, this is a magic party, right? What, what does it look like? Summer pool party at the Fodsteads. We've talked about community groups. Like a lot of times our community groups uh, it gets tough in the summer because people are traveling. So we've kind of recommended, hey, community groups, if you want to keep meeting, that's fine. But also, it's okay to take a break. And instead, let's all get together. And we're going to have some events a couple times a month. And so the Fodsets have graciously hosted uh, I think six, eight, I don't know, pool parties over the summer. Right? It's a Matthew party. We're going to show up. Uh, Brent is going to bring a brisket maybe once. We'll cook some hot dogs, some hamburgers, uh, swimming. And maybe we do some kind of very simple Bible study, or just some conversation. Bring your neighbors over. Hey, let's just talk about Jesus. Let's have spiritual conversations while we're hanging out. That's a Matthew party. A Matthew party can also look like this. We are partnering once again with Maple Grove Covenant Church uh, to do VBS. It's it's a four-day Matthew party. Hey, come, bring your neighbors. Uh, You can sign up to volunteer for uh, a VBS. It's June 24th to the 27th. It's a great opportunity for our kids to hang out with other kids, and they, they learn about Jesus, uh, they play, they have fun, they have some snacks. Again, that's a Matthew party. Uh, maybe it looks like just a weekly bonfire at your house. Hey, anyone's welcome. You know, Thursday nights at my house, we're going to have a bonfire, we're going to cook up s'mores, and you know what, we're just going to have spiritual conversations. That's a Matthew party. Again, maybe it's saying, hey, we're going to go to a Twins game, and hey, just my pastor's coming with me, and we're going to have some conversations, or it's, it's a breakfast meeting, right? There's so many different things we can do that we don't have to invite people to a church service to introduce them to Jesus, right? Like, that's what I love about uh, like the breakfast clubs, kids from different churches coming together to learn about Jesus. Like this summer, community groups coming together, hanging out at the pool. Let's talk about Jesus. It's an easy invitation to a neighbor. We have people at our church who, have co- who are here because of the Fodsteads pool. Praise God for that pool. Amen. What can you do this spring, this summer, to throw some Matthew parties? You don't think too much about it. You know, what, what can you do to invest in some other people to have an invitation? Hey, come. Let's explore. Let's ask questions because you know what? Jesus would like you. And I want you to meet this Jesus. You know, invite them to Mosaic, church service, your community group, that's fine too. But I think having Matthew parties is a great way to reach out. Here's the thing. More and more in the Western church, we have really lost sight of evangelism. Because we feel like, ah, it's icky. I don't want to, like, proselytize, Right? And so it can be really hard to talk about our faith and say, like, hey, if you were to die tonight, do you know where you're going to go? And so what can we do? We, we can do some events. We can say, hey, we're going to throw a Matthew party, right? We don't have to call it that, but we're going to invite some people over. We're going to have some food. We're going to have some conversations. Let's talk about Jesus. Now, here's the important thing. It's not just hanging out. That's, that's cool. That's fellowship. But can you have some kind of spiritual component, some kind of thing where, hey, we're going to discuss something here? where Jesus gets brought up. How can this be, you know, just uh, a first introduction to faith and to Jesus and, 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 and just encourage all of us. We want to raise the evangelistic temperature of our church, right? To say, man, we want to see people far from God meet Jesus, amen? We're going to do a baptism service like we do almost every summer at Weaver Lake. Man, how great would it be? We've got a couple months until then that people meet Jesus and then want to get baptized with that. Like, that's why I'm here, right? Like, we want to learn together to believe the right things, to behave the right way, to follow Jesus. But if it just stops there, we're Pharisees. Jesus says he's come to call. So let's partner with Jesus to introduce people who are far from him. And again, I think this is one way we can do that. And who doesn't like a good party, right? 
So in a little bit, we're going to have a Matthew party. We're going to hang out here. And uh, again, we're just going to have some pizza, have some games. I would encourage you, hey, just connect with someone you don't normally connect with. You know, if you've got a, a little bit of time before running out of here right away, you know, enjoy a slice of pizza or whatever it might be. And uh, let's just enjoy each other. Have some spiritual conversations. Uh, you know, just ask someone, hey, what are you learning right now? What's inspiring you? It's so easy to talk about kids or the weather or sports, right? But e even this afternoon, how can we just get to know each other a little better? Um, I'm going to pray for us, and the band's going to come up, and we're going to do one closing song. God, I thank you, again, that when we were not looking for you, you were looking for us and pursuing us and loving us, and we thank you for that. And God, for those of us who are your followers, we thank you. We've been invited into your family, and, and we've been invited in. But God, there's so many people who feel like outsiders, who feel like they don't belong, who are hurting, who need a doctor. God, I pray that you would raise the evangelistic temperature of our church. God, that we would have a desire to invite people who don't know you into a relationship with you. God, that we would be creative in ways to throw Matthew parties, to, to, to have some food, to invite people, to have spiritual conversations. God, I pray that we'd see fruit from that. God, I pray that every one of us in this room would be able to develop a relationship with someone who doesn't know you and be able to see them come to, to faith in you. God, we want to see salvations. We want to see people who are broken and hurting find salvation in you and find healing in you. God, we want to see people get baptized this summer. And God, we want our church to grow, not just with other, from other churches, but God, from people who don't know you. So God, we just pray you would use us to make a difference as we partner with you, our healer, our savior. Thank you, God, just for our many, many blessings. Thank you, God, for loving us and pursuing us. Let us never lose sight of that and never lose sight of being like you to pursue those who don't feel like they can be allowed in. In your name we pray, God. Amen. Why don't you stand? Uh, let's go out for singing, and then we're going to hang out together.